But Jesus said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Good morning. Thank you for coming and worshiping in the service today. And those that are watching online, we want to welcome you as well. As we gather today, uh, I'm just reminded of the fact that we have a commonality. We, we share something in common. We are all sinners. I am a sinner in need of a Savior. And the good news is God has sent a Savior. The bad news is every single one of us, when we come into this world, we're not perfect Every single one of us faces temptation. Every single one of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And just coming to the place where we can admit that kind of thing and and realize that this is the reality, that it's not just us, it's every person before us. It's the very first people who ever existed that they too had fallen short, that in the Garden of Eden, faced with an option of choosing the truth and the word of God or choosing their own way, Adam and Eve decided to go their own way, and as a result, death entered the world. Death came physically. Death came spiritually. We're all dead in our sins and our transgressions, so that's the really bad news. But the really good news, which means gospel, is that God isn't content to leave us separated from him. That in a moment of time, he would send his son, Jesus Christ, who is God. He's God and man, went to a cross, and he died on that cross for our sins, the sins that all of us have in our lives. And he rose from the dead. He's alive today. Jesus is God. He's ascended to the Father, and one day he's returning. But every single one of us have the opportunity to seek his forgiveness and to have our sins washed and cleansed. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't struggle with sin. Every single one of you in this room, we struggle with sin. You might think, well, I know some pretty good people, and I'm pretty good myself. Well, even that's a sin. (laughs) Because God said, you shall love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I can guarantee you, even since waking up this morning, I've not accomplished that. Not a one of us have. And so we have something in common, you and I, sin. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56 and 7, the sting of death is sin. The sting of sin is death, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the reality of the matter is that life apart from Christ, and some of you have chosen that, life apart from Christ is one of battles and losses. But life with Christ is one of battles but victories. Because Jesus Christ has brought victory over death, hell, and the grave. Doesn't mean we're not battling to this day. We will face the battle with temptation that is common to all mankind. But we have the opportunity, being indwelt by the Spirit of God, receiving Jesus Christ to walk in holiness and to be empowered by that Spirit to drop to our knees every single time any one of us sin, including your pastor, and receive forgiveness once again. It's not as if I lose salvation every time I sin, but it is the opportunity to come before the one who has conquered hell, death, and the grave, and my sin, and to seek his forgiveness, and he gives it every time, and that can be yours. There is a battle that is going on, and the problem is a sin problem. It's a sin problem. It's a sin problem in this world. It's a sin problem in your life, in your family. And and since it, it is a battle that has been brought, which has come to all of humanity, which brought damnation and death and despair, if you're going to overcome sin, then you have to overcome and conquer Satan, and that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. Not a fairy tale, not a myth, happened in a moment in time. And we're in the book of Luke, and and last week we were in Luke chapter 3 at the end, and we were looking at the genealogy of Jesus. And among other things, we were reminded that God is Jesus. Jesus is God, that he is 100% God. He's 100% man. He's the God-man, Jesus Christ. 
And we saw in there that he is a son of God, it says. He is the son of God, and he is a son of Adam. And just like Adam was tempted, the first human being, just like he was tempted, the first Adam, the second Adam, that's Jesus, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, the second Adam would be tempted in the same way. Jesus Christ will face the same kind of temptation, whether or not he will overcome sin and conquer Satan. So where we kind of leave off in, in the life of Jesus, if you recall, he was baptized in the Jordan River by the Apostle John. And as Jesus comes up out of the water, we hear this audible voice from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And from that moment, Jesus leaves the Jordan River and he's led by the Spirit of God and he's led out in the wilderness to be tempted. And that's where we find ourselves here in Luke chapter four. We find ourselves and he's in the wilderness. And while he's in the wilderness there in the desert, that's the moment that lying, murdering, accusing, slimy serpent Satan comes along and he is going to tempt Jesus. That serpent wanted Jesus dead from the moment that he was born. Had all those children wiped out at that time. He wants to do away with Jesus. And so Satan is going to present some temptations to Jesus. And, and, and if Jesus would succumb to these, salvation would not be possible for any one of us. And we would still be lost in our sin. So right here, we see a battle, a battle that has been waged and been going on ever since the beginning of creation. It's going on in what we're going to read today. And it's going on today for your heart and your soul and the heart and soul of your family members. There is a battle. So just as Adam was tested in the wilderness, now Jesus, the second Adam, will be tested. I'm sorry, Adam was tested in the garden. Jesus is going to be tested in this wilderness. Now, as we think about this, I want you to know something. God will never tempt you. God doesn't tempt. We can count on Satan to do that. We can count on ourselves to do, do that. But God does not tempt anyone. It tells us in James chapter 1, verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, God I'm being tempted by God, for God himself cannot be tempted, and he himself tempts no one. So God won't tempt us, but he will test us. He will put us in positions where we are tested. Now, what's the difference? Well, uh, temptation is where you're enticed to disobey, right? Uh, here's some bait. Take the bait. God doesn't entice us to sin. However, there are moments when we are in positions and places where we will be tested, and we see this throughout scripture. Lots of people have been tested. If you go back to the book of Genesis, we find the father of the faith. His name is Abraham. Abraham was tested at one point about whether or not he would sacrifice his son Isaac. You go to the book of Job. And Job, very early on, what we find at the beginning of Job, you find Satan in the presence of God. Now, just understand, Satan is a real being. Satan came in the form of a serpent in the garden. But back in, in Job, he's coming before God. And he says, God, the only reason Job serves you is because you're blessing him. You're prospering him. You're protecting him. You take his prosperity. You take his protection. He'll curse you to your face, God. And so Job was tested. He passed the test. Adam and Eve are tested in the garden. They failed the test. And now Jesus is tested. He's led into the wilderness. And he's tempted, not by God, by Satan. Luke 4, verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry, as you can imagine. So I want you to think about something. All right, here's some contrast for us. At the beginning, you have Adam and Eve, and they're being tempted in the garden. There's no sin, there's no death, and there in paradise, they have everything they could possibly want to eat. All kinds of food. It's like a buffet in front of them all the time. And Adam, he, he had someone with him. He had Eve. He had his spouse. So here's Adam. He's got a full belly and his spouse is with him. Now we move forward in time. Now we're going to find the temptation of Jesus. He's not in the Garden of Eden. This is not paradise. This is a wilderness. It's like a desert. And he has nobody with him. He's all alone. And it's almost as if the odds are stacked against Jesus in a way that it wasn't stacked for Adam and Eve. And here what we find is him in the wilderness, very hungry. And so Satan's point of attack, though, even though there's some dissimilarities between the location, there is similarities in the way that Satan begins to present himself. If we go back to the garden, in the garden you have Eve and then Satan in the form of the serpent comes along 
And he says to Eve, did God really say you can't eat from any of the fruit of these trees? Now, God hadn't said that. But what I believe Satan is doing in this moment, he, he's saying, if God is going to restrict you, Eve, with one of these trees, well, he might as well restrict you on all the trees. God's holding out on you. He's beginning to sow some seeds of doubt. But here's the way that Eve responded. She said, no, God, God said that we may eat of any of the trees in the garden. However, we can't eat from that tree because the day that we eat from that tree, God said, we'll die. And Satan said, you won't die. And now Eve is faced with a decision. Is she gonna trust God's word or is she gonna trust this lie from Satan? And Eve takes a look at that tree and the fruit on that tree looks fantastic. And she's probably thinking to herself, you know, what, what is the harm in just a little taste of disobedience? And so she decides to believe the lie, to take the temptation, and she goes and she grabs that fruit. And in the moment that she grabs that fruit in my mind, I kind of see it paused, if you will, and she's holding it just before she takes a bite of it. And I'm thinking, if I could go back in time, I would like to slap that fruit out of her hand. I'm not trying to put myself above Eve. I think I probably would have ate it myself, right? I know me. I, I, I have given in to temptation. But I think about that moment. What would it be like knowing, having hindsight of all that has happened and what happened as a result of disobedience and sin coming into the world and death? All of us have experienced loved ones who have died because of that moment. They were in paradise. They had God. There was no death. There was no sin. She eats the fruit, and now there's sin. There's wrath. There's dysfunction. There's pain. There's wickedness. We see it all around us. What would happen if in that moment, if you ever create a time machine, <laughs> go on back. You're like, where should I go? Go back there. Make a movie about it if you can't make a time machine. Like, what begins to happen? When we begin to live in the presence of God and, and we trust him and obey him, well, this is heaven. But instead, Eve decides to sink her teeth into the lie. She takes a bite of that fruit and then she hands it to her husband, Adam, and he too tastes. And in that moment, Adam and Eve plunged humanity into death and destruction. It may have been sweet on the lips, but it was death to the soul. And it's death to every single soul, yours and mine. We can't shake the fact. We are sinners. Where did that come from? It came from the fall, the sin that we find here. And so Satan comes along, and he begins the same kind of attack on Jesus, it says, Jesus, if you are the son of God, uh, why don't you turn this stone into bread? Taste. Eat. Break your fast. Enjoy breakfast. Verse three. The devil said to Jesus, if you are the son of God. Now let's stop here for a second. If you are the son of God. I think, I know, he knows Jesus is the son of God. He was actually created by Jesus. Satan is a created being. He doesn't doubt that. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind, he's probably seeing if he can weasel his way into some sort of pride. If you're the son of God, let's do some stuff. All right, just lean into your deity and start doing these things on your own. He knows full well that Jesus is the son of God, that he is God. The demons know that Jesus is God. I read one commentator, I liked his comment. He said, the devil never questioned Jesus' deity. The demons never questioned Jesus' deity. Only liberal theologians question Jesus' deity. <laughs> so what, what, what we're getting across is that God has created these angels. And at a moment in time, they disobeyed, they rebelled, and a third of them fell. And Satan is the prince of these demons. They're real, they exist. And they know who Jesus is. Over and over, they're like, hey, Jesus, son of God, you, you can't torment us before our time. They know who he is. Satan knows who he is. And he says this. 
If you're the son of God, command this stone to become bread. Turning a stone into bread, what's the temptation? I mean, wouldn't it be a temptation for us because we can't do that? We, we can't take stones and turn them into bread. And we know that making bread isn't a sin. Otherwise, bakers would be the chief of sinners. We realize that eating bread isn't sinful unless it's gluten-free. That is awful stuff. So what, what is it? What, what is going on here? Well, here, here's the implication. The implication is that Satan knows that Jesus has on his own decided that he will not just lean into his independent use of his deity, that he is going to submit himself to the Father, that he isn't going to take matters into his own hands and go through life on his own. He is here to do the will of the Father. And at this moment, Jesus has been asked to fast, And so Satan comes along and he says, Jesus, you haven't had anything to eat for 40 days. You're starving. And God, your father, hasn't provided anything for you to eat. Could it be that maybe God doesn't love you as much as you think he loves you? And that's the first temptation. The first temptation is to distrust God's love, to distrust God's love. In these three temptations, the three points that I'll bring to you, they, they're from another pastor. Uh, just be aware so that you're not uh, like thinking, well, my pastor's smart. I know there's no temptation of that, but just so you know. And you can find all kinds of different ways that, that we look at, at these three temptations. But I believe that this encapsulated well, to distrust God's love. I've been tempted to distrust God's love. That, that I would begin to think, all right, God doesn't love me as much as he says he does. Like if God really loved me, If God really loved me, then I wouldn't be in this circumstance. If God really loved me, I wouldn't have this illness. If God really loved me, I wouldn't be facing this. I wouldn't be facing the same temptation over and over and over. And so we don't trust, we distrust. Satan will come along and say, God can't be relied upon, so don't put your faith in him. Don't be obedient to him. There's no need because God doesn't love you. He's withholding something good from you. This is the formula that he used with Eve. If God really loved you, why would he restrict you from that tree? Why would he do that? Well, it's because he doesn't love you. And Eve bought into the lie and she took the fruit and she ate it. Anything wrong with fruit? Absolutely not. But there is something wrong with distrusting and disobeying God. And so God comes along loving his creation that has fallen away from him and is separated. And he gives us lists of do's and don'ts. And we look at the list of don'ts and we say, ah, God's a fuddy-duddy. God's raining on my parade. God doesn't want me to enjoy. I can't trust him. And so we end up disobeying. But every single, single one of the commands that God has given has been given because he loves us. He says, don't commit Sexual immorality. And he doesn't say that to rain on your parade. He says it to love you because he knows once you step off that cliff and you begin to move in that direction that it brings dysfunction and it brings pain. He tells us the things he wants us to do. He tells us the things that we shouldn't do. Not because he can't be trusted, not because he doesn't love us, but because he loves us as his children. But the temptation on the inside of you and the temptation inside of me is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna meet my own needs. And so then we begin to distort those things that God has placed on the inside of us, just legitimate needs of intimacy. And then we begin to move in the direction of finding an illegitimate way of meeting that because we think God's holding out on me. Satan wants to set Jesus against the Father. Jesus, you shouldn't be hungry. I mean, you of all people, Jesus, you shouldn't be hungry. Even the wicked Israelites out in the wilderness, they got miracle bread. They got miracle manna. They were just a whole bunch of sinners. And yet you, your father who loves you, is making you starve? I mean, lesser men than you have gotten blessed by God. Remember the Israelites out in the wilderness? They were tested. And what happened when they sinned? How long were they in the wilderness? 40 years. There's no accident between the 40 days that Jesus is in the wilderness. There's correlation. 
And now the last words that Jesus had heard at the baptism was, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And then Satan says, really? Is he really would he really be pleased with you if you're hungry and you're starving? Jesus, you owe it to yourself. Take a bite. So again, that slimy, stinking serpent Satan is striking when Jesus now is at his lowest. And Jesus responded and he passed this test. And he passed the test by pointing out the lie. This is what he said, verse four. And Jesus answered him, what is written? Man shall not live by bread alone. I don't, I don't live by just bread. I live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of my father. And right now my father has told me and hasn't allowed me to eat this bread. So kick rocks. Satan undaunted because he's not going to quit until he is absolutely crushed. He's like, okay, well, maybe that's a little low. Let's raise the bar. I've got another offer. Verse five, and the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And this isn't like it, just like a uh, make-believe kind of thing. Satan is a real being. Jesus is a real being. And they are looking at all the kingdoms. Not sure how all of that works out, but it's happening. And Satan said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory. For it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. And Jesus doesn't protest. He doesn't protest that statement. Because this is a true statement. And this is the heart of the issue. All the nations and the kingdom and all the people who have ever existed in these kingdoms and will exist in these kingdoms. Satan knows this is what's at play. If you, he offers, if you, Jesus, then will worship me, it will all be yours. All I ask, all I ask is you just worship me. Just, just for a second. Just, just bend your knee. Maybe bow your head. But Satan says, worship me. You don't have to go through all those hoops, whatever the hoops are going to be, that your heavenly father is giving to you. Take the shortcut. Take the easy way out. Just bend your knee. Just worship me. The second temptation is to distrust God's plan. Distrust God's plan. You can bypass the crown, just take, just, or you can bypass the cross, just take the crown. Bypass all the pain that you might have to go through as a servant of the Father, and just go ahead, worship me, and you can grab it. It's yours. Take the shortcut. Take the easy road. You, you do what's easiest for you. Our temptation is not to trust the plan of God. There's a whole bunch of people in this world, a broad road of people in this world who have decided not to trust God's plan of salvation. God, I'm not interested in repenting of my sin. I'm not interested in serving you, God, in obeying you, God. I'm going to be king of my own kingdom. I'm Lord, and I'm going to worship, well, me. I'm going I'm to worship whatever's in the culture. I'm going to worship money. I'm going to place myself in a position where I don't need to worry about your plan of walking the straight and narrow, but I'm going to trust my plan, and I'm going to go for the gusto, and I'm going to get all that I want to get in this life. I'm going to go my own way. Thank you, Jesus. Not interested in being sanctified by you and bending my knee to worship you. I'll bend my knee to worship me. This is what Jesus said, verse 8. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And so maybe Satan is thinking here, wow, more Bible, more scripture. You, you like scripture, Jesus? Well, I, I could quote scripture. How about I quote some scripture to you? He begins to tempt him once again. So far, what we've seen is there's the seeds of distrust, a distrust of God's love, a distrust of God's plan. And then it says this, 
And Satan took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, is that how that goes, Jesus? For it is written, we're using the Bible. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on your hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Distrust God's love, distrust God's plan, and then finally, go ahead and presume upon God's goodness. You, you just jump, you do you, and God will have to bail you out. Because God's just a great big marshmallow in the sky. He's just full of love and grace, and we can do whatever we want. So we can just launch out, do our thing, and then God can rescue us. We're not interested in what he has to say and the direction that he gives to us. We're just more concerned with, look, uh, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to go in my direction. And I just realized, man, this God guy is really soft. I'll go my own way. He can bail me out. I'll ask for forgiveness. Like, I, I'm going to go ahead and lead the kind of life that I want to live and just keep leaning into whatever my flesh would desire. And then when I'm old, I, when I'm old before I die, that's when I'll receive Christ. When, when, I'm, when I'm old, that's when I'll ask for forgiveness. Or, or maybe right now the guilt and the weight and the shame is so heavy, you have to do something with your guilt. Everybody does. So you think, ah, I'm going to get God. I know he has to forgive me. I'm not going to quit doing this, but I'm just going to keep going back to God and say, I'm sorry, God, please forgive me. And then I'll go right back and do my own thing. But I'm not going to tell him that last part because he can't know what I'm thinking. <laughs> and so we play the game. And here Satan is quoting from Psalm 91. Jump, Jesus. If you jump... You're not going to hurt yourself. The angels are going to come along. They're going to catch you, lift you up, and I'm going to stub your toe. I found it. Jesus, there's a verse for it. Name it and claim it. He's given you this in the Bible. You can just jump. You can just do your thing. You found your way around what God wants you to do. But Satan knew that Jesus is a man. He's 100% man and 100% God, and a fall like that would kill him. That's what he told Eve. Eve, you won't die. She died. Saying, you're, Jesus, you're, you're going to be fine. Just go ahead and jump. He knows he's, he's a man, and when he lands, he will die. But Jesus isn't going to presume upon God. He's not going to take matters into his own hands. Look at verse 12. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus is saying, Satan, God's testing me. I'm not testing him. God isn't here for me. I'm here for him. God isn't my servant. I'm here to serve him. We, we are not the sovereign ones who begin to find scripture verses to twist God's arm. We are not the center of the universe telling God, you're not doing it right. You need to do it my way. And so I'm just going to go ahead and go my way and do my thing. And then if I need to, then I'll ask for forgiveness. But you have to bail me out. And so I'm going to corner you, God. Jesus isn't interested in that. We are here to serve God. He is our creator. It says this then in verse 13. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So I think Satan's pretty honked off that this didn't go the way that he hoped that it would go. And so he leaves, but he'll be back. I'm not sure where in this moment that Satan goes, maybe perhaps to whisper in some Pharisees' ears, telling them how righteous and awesome they are, and they don't need forgiveness either. And they're fine just as they are. And this Jesus fella, yeah, he's a big joke. You can ignore him. But Satan would be back. And every time that Satan came back, Jesus passed the test, and every time Jesus saw him. He saw Satan in the words of Peter, when Jesus was telling his disciples clearly, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. And Peter said, no, you're not. You're not going there, Lord. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. He would see Satan return once again when he filled Judas and Judas then betrayed him. But at every single turn, Jesus overcame. Every time Satan came back again and again and again, and ultimately, Jesus crushed him at the cross. And he crushed him 
at the empty tomb. And ultimately, as king of all kingdoms, Jesus will purge this world of sin. And one day, the final enemy to be defeated is death. And death will be put to death. And there will be no more death. And we will reign with Christ forever. Simply because of what he has done in order to conquer the enemy in a way that you and I cannot do on our own. We must have him. You're going to keep going in circles until you have Christ, until you have the spirit. And even then, I hate to break it to you, you will continue to battle. You will, friend, Christian, face temptation. And there will most likely be times that you fall and that you sin but you are not abandoned. You are not alone. Those who have Christ in them have the spirit of God in them. And we can now overcome in a way that we could not before. This is the way that this section wraps up, verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the spirit to Galilee and a report about him went through, out throughout all the surrounding country and he taught in their synagogues being glorified by all. What's Satan's strategy? What's he up to? He's going to try to get you to distrust God's love, right? You can't, you can't trust him. He's holding out on you. Take those things that you have as a passion on the inside of you. He's going to tempt you to distrust God's plan. You can go your own way. Find your own path. You don't need the narrow path. You don't need Jesus Christ. You don't need to submit. You don't need to be sanctified. You don't need his holiness. You go your way. You will be tempted to presume upon God that God will surely just forgive me and I'm just gonna keep leaning into my sin and God is really soft and he doesn't care about sin. He doesn't really have wrath and I'm just gonna do some end arounds. I might even find some scripture verses to justify my sin. When will the enemy come? All the time. Be careful when you, like Adam and Eve, are at the high point in your life. And everything is going well, and you're doing awesome, and it's just paradise in your life. Because at that moment, you may be in for one of the biggest temptations of your entire life. And like Jesus in the wilderness, be on your guard when you are physically weak, because the enemy looks for opportunity to strike while you are tired, while you are discouraged. Be careful of the people that you interact with, the people that you surround yourself with. People who could care less about giving into temptation and living a holy life because they will drag you down. Be careful when in your own flesh and your own desires, you begin to be pulled in a direction that you naturally will want to go because those desires give birth to sin and sin when fully grown brings death. James 1 verse 14. This is when it happens this is the way that it looks like. How did Jesus defeat Satan? Well, we find him. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, it said at the beginning. And then he's out in the wilderness and he's spending time with the Father and he's praying to him. And every single time that the enemy came, he came back at the enemy with scripture, with the word of God. So I would encourage you, every single time that temptation comes your way, and there is no temptation that has been given to you that is not common to man. Every single one of us are facing the same kind of temptations. You are not alone. It's a lie of the enemy that says, you, nobody else has this temptation. Nobody else is struggling with that. You better not tell anybody because you're awful. Lie. That is a lie. It's a lie that the enemy does. We all face common temptations. The good news of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, is where God provides a way out. Every single time there's temptation in your life, there's a window. It's like the garage door. You click the clicker thing and the garage door comes down. The garage door is coming down. Temptation's coming your way. And the longer you wait to run out of that temptation, the harder and harder it gets. But you know it. When temptation comes your way, every time there's a way of escape. Take the escape. Call out to God. Realize that you no longer have been bound by sin. You have been freed from that sin and you now have the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Call out to God. He will save you. Know scripture and begin to move. You've got to do your part, friend. 
You gotta put your feet to work and start running away from that temptation. Because I'm telling you right now, the battle continues to exist. It exists at this moment. It is a battle for your soul. It is a battle for your children's souls. And the enemy would love for us to continue to give in to our sin and be so ashamed that we won't enter into the battle and call Satan what he is, a big, fat, lying, losing accuser who has been overcome by Jesus Christ. Don't give up. Don't give up. Continue to pursue him. Do not become complacent with the sin in your life. Allow it to break your heart. Allow the holy, that's why he's given this name, the Holy Spirit to convict you. Don't allow that sin in your life to just defeat you and leave you laying on the ground. Allow the Spirit of God to fill you once again, to move in the direction of the cross, to confess your sin, and to receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Not for your salvation, if you've received him, you're saved, but for the washing of your soul, for the relationship with your heavenly Father who wants to strengthen you with his truth so that you might move forward and engage in the battle, friends, that is all around us. But how, how do we do this? How do we see the tide turn in our own lives, in our families' lives, in this culture? We repent. We stop pretending. We stop wearing the mask and we just come to the cross and we confess our sin. I mean, if this world is gonna be transformed, your family's gonna be transformed, it starts in the church. It begins with the body of Christ coming to the throne of God to bow at the cross and to seek his forgiveness to be washed by him it must begin here it must begin with us we must repent let's do that here in just a moment I'm going to just let you talk to God I'm not an intermediary between you and God God wants to deal with your heart and in the silence would you be willing, maybe even for the first time, to come to Christ and allow him to do the work of changing you from the inside out? He has mercy in his eyes. He has grace to dispense when we come to him and bow. I'll serve you and you only. Wash me, cleanse me, make me new. Take a moment here. Repent. Repent. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your sacrifice on the cross, dying in my place. I deserve the wrath of God. Thank you for stepping between me and a holy God to receive punishment on my behalf. I am a sinner and I need a savior. And I thank you that this gospel good news that a savior is to be had is not just a once in a lifetime deal, but it's for me today. Thank you for this good news. That when I repent, you are faithful to forgive me, to cleanse me, to fill me with your righteousness. I don't have a righteousness of my own to bring to you. I thank you that you fill me. Father, as the body of Christ, please begin here. Would you, would you make us a holy bride? Father, in our own lives, in our own homes, every time we sin, Lord, we want to be faithful to come back before you, to admit these things that are wrong, that are sinful, and to seek the transforming work that you would do on the inside of us so that we might walk in righteousness, walk in holiness, not a righteousness of our own, but the righteousness that comes from Christ. We look forward to the day, Father, where we no longer have to face temptation in heaven 
Until then, Lord, as we face this temptation, may we overcome through the power of your spirit and through the beauty of your word being lived out in us as we are obedient to your call. God in heaven, you are holy. On our own, we are not holy. Holy is your name. God, may your kingdom come and your will be done in our hearts, in our lives, in this world. And Father, we pray that you would give us this day our daily bread. And please forgive us of our debts, our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed and sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours, God, is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I pray to God that you leave this place lighter than you came in, knowing that the work of God to cleanse you, to transform you, to change you, isn't just for this moment. 